um, as a parent uh, for three girls, three and under, is that I get to see these different stages, right? As, as kids are young, you get to see these little obstacles or, or things that they learn. And, and I've got a, a three-month-old, and so right now she's learning to smile, learning to laugh, and pretty soon rolling over. I've, I've got a little 20-month-old, Shay, and she's starting to talk a little more and more, finding her voice, finding her personality. I've got Emerson, who is three. Uh, my wife just told me this yesterday, but the, the phrase three-nager, I'd, I'd never heard that before, but whoo, three, this is, uh, <laughs> this is an interesting one, but she's figuring things out too and, and becoming this little girl right now. And another joy is to talk to parents in similar stages and hear their stories as well. I was talking to Blake Steinbrecher about a month and a half ago. We dropped off our, our little girls, Abby and Emmy, they're in the two-year-old classroom, and as we're walking away, his little girl, Abby, said, Daddy, I want to go to the bathroom. She wanted to go to the bathroom, and he said, hey, we've got her potty trained now. Whew, potty training. That's good. And you know what rose up in me? All of a sudden, this, this insecurity rose up in me of jealousy and of fear because my daughter Emerson, who was older than Abby, was not yet potty trained. And all of a sudden, I started comparing my child to his. And really what was going on in that moment, instead of looking at my little girl who was in this classroom with her friends, people serving her and, and investing in her for mission who loved her, and she's learning about God at such a young age, I decided to focus on the fact that she hadn't been potty trained yet. And that's what comparison does. It takes these, these little things as we compare to others and it magnifies them. And with these things, we attach our value, we attach our worth, we attach our identity. I, I wasn't a good father. I hadn't done this yet for my girls. More about me than about her. And in those moments as we compare to others who are maybe past us in some things, we get insecure and we can get bitter and it brings disunity. Or, or we can compare in things that maybe we're a little further along at. Blake maybe felt some pride right there. Michael hasn't done a good job yet. And so pride can sneak in. But in the midst of that comparison, whatever you're comparing yourself to and attaching your value to, love does not exist. And so this morning in the comparison struggle, it is very real. And this struggle infiltrates every area of our lives. Uh, my wife just this past week was saying, do you remember when we were pregnant with our first, and we were going to do the Facebook announcement, right? The, the Facebook announcement, our first child, and we're pregnant. And just a little bit before we did, one of her friends announced the same thing. And all of a sudden, she said this, this jealousy rose up in her. Why is that? She was still pregnant. We were still going to have our little girl. We were going to announce it. But it's in the midst of comparison. If someone else is elevated, we might have to be diminished that we attach this value to. And in our day of age, we're so aware of everyone else's lives, right? We're in a day of age, we're so aware, but it's only a partial awareness. Most of what I see is positive out on social media. It's mostly positive. But I know I'm fully aware of my own life and my own heart. And so against this mostly positive backdrop, I bring my full awareness of myself and I set it against that. And so comparison is fueled even more. Awareness fuels comparison. This partial awareness turns it into a raging fire. Awareness fuels comparison. But this morning, I want to look at something else, something a little deeper. I want to look at what really ignites comparison. Awareness may fuel it, but what ignites this very real struggle in us? And I think two main things. When love is misunderstood and when hope is misplaced, when love is misunderstood and hope is misplaced, awareness is ignited. Because really what we're asking in those two things is this. Can anyone love me as I really am? Not, not what I portray, not what I want others to see, but, but as what I, I really am, right? Can anyone love me? And secondly, where do I put my hope? Right? Where, where can I put my hope that I would be satisfied? Can anyone love me as I really am? Where can I put my hope that I would be satisfied? It are these two things that ignite comparison. But here's the good news today. Even though awareness may fuel comparison, when we answer these two questions in truth, 
awareness all of a sudden fuels something else. Awareness is not a bad thing because when those two questions are answered rightly, awareness will fuel love, awareness will fuel opportunity, and awareness will fuel service. And so my prayer today is that after looking at those two questions, that we will walk out of here more fully aware of what is going on around us, and it will not cause comparison, but it will bring opportunity. We're going to be in John 21 today. So if you have your Bible, if you have uh, the Bible that, that this church gives you, this Bible right here, it's going to be on page 757. You can get out your phone or your own Bible, John 21. And we're going to be looking at a story about Peter and Jesus, an interaction between Peter and Jesus. And we're going to see in this interaction, Peter's first response is comparison. And then Jesus leads him to something else. So John 21, we're going to start in verse 18. Now Jesus has been crucified before this. And remember, the night before the crucifixion, Peter denied him three times. And so he was crucified the next day, and he rose a few days later. And so where this scene is, is seven of the apostles, after the resurrection of Jesus, are out on the Sea of Galilee fishing, and Jesus shows up. They have a miraculous catch of fish. They come in, and they're sitting around a fire with Jesus. Now, this is a a beautiful picture of restoration for Peter. Because Peter before had denied Jesus at night around a fire in public. And now we see in the morning light in public around a fire, Jesus is going to restore Peter. And he says, Peter, I want you to feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? I want you to feed my sheep. He asks him three times to restore him, saying, I'm going to give you my church, Peter, and I want you to serve my church. And that's right up to verse 18. And now the scene shifts. Verse 18, Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. Kind of vague, right? A little vague. So so John clarifies a little more in verse 19. We're going to keep going. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. So what Jesus is saying back then, the the phrase, stretch out your hands, as you saw in verse 18, that was a phrase for crucifixion. So what Jesus is saying is, Peter, you just confirmed and I just restored you to ministry and you are going to serve me. And you know what, Peter? You are going to serve me faithfully. But Peter, I'm going to tell you, when you get older, that's what he's saying, you're going to be crucified. Wow. Wow. Just, just kind of sit in that moment for a second. Peter, you're going you're gonna to serve me, but at the end of your life, you're going to be crucified. And then, and then he says this, the end of 19, follow me. What's the very next word in verse 20? The very next two words, Peter turned. He says, Peter, follow me. The very next thing John tells us is Peter turned. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? John is is basically saying the one who wrote this gospel, it was me. I was behind them. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Now what we don't know from from the verse, because we can't hear Peter's voice, we don't know if Peter said it like, well, Lord, what about him? You know, kind of in anger and this fleshly response. We, we don't know. Or if he said, well, Lord, what about him? You know, what about John? I'm gonna, what about John? Out of this, this concern for his friend. We, we don't know. But, but John's point is this. What Jesus is calling Peter to, a life of service to him. He's not calling Peter to not care about people around him, but he's saying this, Peter, you got to follow me. You have to. Because if you're going to bear the weight of serving the church, if you're going to be involved with people, the only way to do that well is if you focus on me. Peter, follow me. The author of Hebrews says it like this in Hebrews 12. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him scorned the cross 
and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. As we share life with people, as we are called to serve and be with people, the only way to do that well is to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Right away, Peter looked at the circumstances of another in comparison, and Jesus brought him back to himself and said, Peter, follow me. I think the key today is that. Who was calling Peter to follow him? And you can say, it's Jesus, and it is. It's Jesus, but, but who is Jesus? Who did Peter see on that day? Who was standing in front of him? Who could say, Peter, serve me, you're going to be crucified, but follow me. Here's who Peter saw. He saw Jesus Christ, who had scars on his wrist, scars on his feet, scars on his side. And Jesus Christ in a resurrected, glorified body. The one who called Peter was one who had scars and glory. And as he called Peter to follow him, today he calls you to follow him. And in the face and in the struggle of comparison, where we question love and hope, the scars speak to love and the glory speaks to hope. Comparison is ignited when love is misunderstood. And the question we ask is, can anyone love me as I really am? And what the scars tell us is yes. The scars answer that question with yes. The world will say no. Comparison says no. The scars say yes. You see, you are created by God. And you are created by a God who was in perfect relationship, eternity past, This is a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. He did not create us out of need. He created us out of this free, absolute love to show us His glory. And when He created us in His image, He said it is very good. And He created us to worship Him and to love Him and to love others who are created in His image. And yet, sin entered the world. And in our hearts, we've taken that love that is meant for God and for others, and we've turned it in on ourselves. We've turned it in on ourselves. And this is the tension of the scars. Because in them, we see that we have value. You are made in God's image, and you have great value. But also in them, we have seen that we have rebelled against God, who we are supposed to love and love others, and we have loved ourselves. And because of that, The Bible says we are separated from God, the one who made us, that we are separated from him. And we and we hear that and we're so conditioned to attach our performance to love. Right. If I fail at something, then I'm not worthy. Or if I fail at something, then I'm not loved. And so when you hear that, when you hear that, that we have fallen short, it's hard sometimes to hear that because we often equate that with being loved. That's the misunderstanding of love we have to clear up. Because we're not worthy. We're not. We have value, but we're not worthy. We have fallen short. But in that, we are loved. And that's the beauty of the gospel. I pray you walk out of here knowing that you're loved by the Father. If that's, if that's what you hear today, you are loved by the Father. Sometimes I'll ask people, that whether I know them well or not, sometimes I'll just ask, you know, do you know that God loves you? Do you know that nine times out of ten, the reason for that love is circumstantial? Yeah, because of, of these things that have happened. You know what the Bible points to? The truest act of love it says God demonstrates his love and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. It was costly. First John Four says this, in this is love. Not that we loved God, we didn't initiate. It's that God loved us. This is a love that's not only costly, but it pursues. He loved us. Then it says he sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. And that word propitiation means a satisfying of wrath, right? 
We don't like to talk about wrath, again, because we equate love with our performance. And if someone's angry at us, then surely they can't love us. But that's not true. God, who is good and holy, His reaction to sin is wrath. That's what a loving person does. If you see evil, you come up against it, right? Anything not good, we we come up against that. And so God's reaction to our sin is wrath. But know this, God's wrath is what we call a secondary characteristic of God. His primary characteristics, holiness, goodness, justice, those don't change. Wrath is just an outworking of those things. Where there's no sin, there's no wrath. Where there's no sin, there's no wrath. And so God in His love sent His Son, the eternal Son, to become a man. And this God-man lived a sinless life. And those scars, they're from being crucified. And His blood, His infinitely valued blood, being God, was spilled at a very costly, costly sacrifice. And only His blood, the blood of God, could satisfy the infinite wrath of God. And Him being man, He could stand in our place. And so God's love, the clearest picture, is demonstrated at that cross. Because there he pursued us, and there the blood was spilt, and that is a demonstration of love. At your worst, God knows you. He knows me. He knows me so well, better than I know myself. And he pursued us and demonstrated that at the cross. And Jesus rose from the dead, defeating death. And God said, if you trust in him, If you trust in Him, all your sins are wiped away. And so those scars, those scars of Christ, you look to them today when you feel that urge to base love on performance. And every day for me, it's a struggle. Every day. I love getting to come up and to preach, but to be honest, it's a battle. It is in my heart and in my soul. It's a battle. Two weeks ago, Aubrey Sampson preached. And if you're here, it's an incredible message. She's a gifted communicator, brought us to Christ in the midst of suffering and so transparently shared of herself. The next day on Facebook, John Peacock said, Aubrey Sampson, one of my favorite Bible teachers. And I read that. And you know what my first thought was when I read that? It wasn't, amen. Amen, God. <laughs> it was, what about me? John, what about me? And as I started to read through the comments, what about me? I think one of the greatest indicators of where we're at with God's love is when someone else is praised, when, when someone else is elevated, what's your gut response? Tell what mine was. <laughs> what about me? This battle of comparison, this, this struggle rages every day. It's raging in me right now. You know what the scars tell me? God knew. He knew I would struggle with that. He knows I'm struggling with it right now. And His love is so good and His grace is so good that it's not based upon me. It's based upon Him. And so today, today, as we struggle with comparison, fight it with the scars of Christ. And secondly, We struggle, and what ignites comparison is this misplaced hope. And really this this question, where do I put my hope? Where where can I be satisfied? We have these, these longings within us, right? Where do we find our satisfaction? Lord, if if I just had that marriage, or if I just had these children, or if I just had that house, or if I just had that job, surely I would be satisfied. If I just had that that body or that hair, or those clothes, surely then, right, I would be satisfied. And often our our hope is most intimately bound up in our bodies, right? And as I see my body start to age and pull the gray hair this morning, actually, I just in the mirror pulled, pulled one out. My hope is often revealed, God, I don't like seeing this. 
I'm starting to, to grow older and I'm, I'm wasting away and I compare with others. Where is your hope and how are you comparing to find that satisfaction? You know what Jesus did with Peter here? I don't, I don't know his main reasoning, but, but you know one thing that happened? He said, Peter, your body is going to be crushed. It, it's going to be crushed and you're going to die. Let's not like go around that point. How could Peter live in light of that? The rest of his life, everything that he did, he knew how he was going to die. How could he do that? Here's how. The one who stood in front of him had been crushed. Peter knew that his body had been crushed. And yet here was Jesus Christ, resurrected from the dead, in a body that was incorruptible, will never change again. Do you know that? Jesus Christ is in his body forever. When we see him, he will be in a physical body that will never change. Change what Peter saw, we will see. And Jesus could call Peter to that life. And he's saying, Peter, your hope has got to shift. It cannot be in the temporal. It can't. Peter, you're going to see James beheaded. Peter, you're going to see friends killed for the gospel. Peter, you're going to heal many people. In fact, Peter, you saw me heal many people. Those people will get sick again and they will die. Lazarus, who I raised from the dead, he will die. Peter, your hope has got to shift. And Jesus could say that because he stood in front of him with an incorruptible body and the promise that one day, one day, the hope is not that we just float off in some, some cloud and maybe we'll be with God and maybe we'll, will we recognize people? I don't know because they're... Bu- no, the hope is that one day God will come back down to earth, will restore earth and will resurrect us with new bodies and we will be here forever. That's the hope. And he could call Peter and he can call us to this life. And we compare and we do because it is a struggle. Just the other day with my three-year-old, I'm, I'm in the midst of this message, right? So I have it on my head. And she's sitting on a chair and she has two Band-Aids, one on each knee. She had fallen and scraped her knees. And I said, Emerson, do you know that one day you're going to get a new body and you're never going to need Band-Aids again? And she looked at me with her eyes and screamed, no. <laughs> and i got to know my audience, to a three-year-old who loves frozen Band-Aids to put them on herself all over, that was not the hope that she wanted. (laughs) She did not want to hear that at that moment. But in that moment, I also realized, what if we talked about resurrection like that? What if my daughter knew it was a regular thing? Do you know what? One day we'll be resurrected. Because now it's scraped knees, but she's going to get older, Lord willing, and the hurts get a little bigger. What if I prepared her now? I mean, one day you will be in a new body. And you know what? Relationships, they will be restored. They'll be perfect. You'll be able to see God and you'll be on an earth that is not cursed, but is restored. They'll satisfy your longings. Those longings you have, guys, those longings that we have, those frustrations that we have, what if they point to the fact that we're meant for something more? We don't like disease. We don't like things rotting and and wearing down. I don't like my body breaking down and death is the great enemy that will one day finally be defeated. But it's a sign pointing that things aren't the way they're supposed to be and we're made for so much more. And so with comparison, often the, the trap that we get into in these moments is that, that we look and, and we look at kind of the scale and we say, well, I, I'm going through a, a hard moment right now. And then we either look to people who are going through things a little less, maybe they have it easier, and we think, well, okay, my moments are a little harder. God, what's going on? Right? God, What's going on here? What am I doing wrong? Or, or we look out to other people and maybe they're going through something harder. And they kind of wake up and we think, well, God, I really shouldn't feel that bad about my life right now because this person is going through something much harder. Now, remember, I'm not, I'm not telling you not to be aware. Awareness can be good. But when our hope is misplaced, awareness brings comparison. And the New Testament writers never tell us to find joy and to get through our suffering by comparing it to more or less suffering of other people. 
Here's what they tell us. Romans 8, 18 through 30 is a beautiful picture of this. Paul is, is bringing suffering and hope together. What he says is this. You compare your suffering to the eternal hope of every believer. Uh, Douglas Moo, who's a commentator, says this in his commentary on Romans. And he says this transcendently wonderful, I love that word, this transcendently wonderful hope that we have with its weight will throw that suffering off the scale as if it had no weight at all. Now hear me on this. I'm not saying that suffering isn't hard. It is. I mean, it's, it's, it's a result of the fall. It's, it's evil. We can't just overlook it. If we don't make less of our suffering and get to joy by trying to compare it to others. Don't make less of it. Just make more of your hope. Don't try to make less of your suffering. It's part of the fall. It's evil. Disease, death, comparison, relationships that are broken, they're not good. We're made for more. So don't make less of that. Make more of your hope. And in that is joy. So hope that is placed in the eternal will defeat comparison. So we have love, rightly seen, and we have hope rightly placed. And now you may think, well, great. A love that, that never changes, a hope that's for the future. So what do we do now? <laughs> what do we do now? And that's the beauty of it. As you guys see the love of Christ and his love for you, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, it's the love of Christ that compels us, Right? It's his love that would compel us out. And so as you see the scars and as you see his love, you will be compelled out to be with people. That's ministry. You're with people. That's all it is. And you'll be compelled to be with people. But again, because of the fall, because of sin, because of the, the hope that is not realized, the more we're with people, the more we dig with people, more pain comes. It's part of it. We see more suffering. And so though love would compel us, hear this, hope gives us the strength to stay. Love will compel us. Hope will give us the strength to stay. And as we are there, with our eyes fixed on this eternal hope, not comparing, but freely entering the lives of people, we are able to give a glimpse of that hope. For that's what we are called to. We're called to bring that hope now, even though it's not fully realized, to be a testament of this gospel, to be a testament of this love and hope. We enter into people's lives and we give them a taste and a glimpse of that hope and that love. Awareness can be a fuel for love and not comparison. When your eyes are fixed on the scars in the glory of Christ. Father, you know where each person in here is and what they're going through. If they know you or not, if, if they're close with you now or not, and I pray today that as their eyes are fixed on you, that comparison would be defeated and the awareness would actually bring opportunity to love others. And I pray that that would encourage us to go into ministry and to share our lives with others. May we bring that hope as much as we can now fixed on the assurance of the future. Oh, Father, please, by your spirit, may we glorify your Son. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for watching Mission Church Online. It's our prayer that this message both challenged and inspired you. We hope you will join us in redefining what church could be in your life by taking a next step. Whether that's sharing this message with a friend, joining us live next Sunday, or requesting prayer by emailing us at prayer at wearemission.com. We believe that these are moments that can lead to movement.